thought we were done with Isaiah 28. <clears throat> and I promise we will be after this lesson, because 29 is the last verse. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 28, and if you have your outlines, go ahead and get them out. If you don't, there are still some bulletins in the back, and they should be there. I gave you a hint on what we're talking about, the chastening of the Lord. I am sure that sometimes you feel like life is running you over with a plow or a horse cart. Over and over and over again. It's as if as soon as you move beyond one problem, another crops up. Or the same one comes right back. Maybe they switch between the two, new and old and the same and different. It could be related to your health. Perhaps it is finding or keeping a job. Relationships sometimes struggle in this way. Or even people that struggle with addictions. There is a lot of, of different ways this can happen in our lives where it just feels like things are not going right. If you open your Bible there in Isaiah chapter 28, I want us to read verses 23 through 26. And I want us to notice a few things as we go. In verse 23, he says, Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. He's going to ask a really important question here in verse 24. Notice what he says. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? Now, I know that you all are likely not farmers. <coughs> but he's asking a fairly basic question. Does the guy pushing the plow or having the plow drawn by an animal of some kind, does he do it all day, every day, forever and ever? And the simple answer is, of course not. Of course, the plowman doesn't constantly plow. He plows until the ground is the way it's supposed to be. And in fact, in 25, he says, when he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat and rose, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt, or the rye, in its place? For he instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him. The he there, he instructs him in right judgment. God instructs the plowman in right judgment. God is the one who informed plowmen how to do their job. They don't consistently and continually plow. No one does. Because plowing is not an end of itself. It doesn't benefit you in and of itself. It only benefits you if you then, once the plowing is complete and the job is done, move to plant. Plowing is a means to an end. Plowing and threshing. But there is coming a time, God says, when God will plant again. Remember the context that we have already covered here in Isaiah chapter 28. All of the persecution, all of the trials, all of the judgments that are coming down upon Israel and Judah and Jerusalem and all of the places all around it. But he's speaking specifically to his own people. God is speaking to his people through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, You feel like the plow has just been driven through your town over and over again. The plowman won't leave your home alone. And you feel like all the time your life is being overturned, and things are going wrong. But remember that the plowman doesn't plow forever. The plowman plows for a purpose, and we'll get to that purpose in a bit. He's going to talk about threshing as well. And the same point will be applicable to threshing. Uh -oh. You don't thresh forever. There's no point. You thresh until the job is done, and then you scoop up the grain, whatever it is that you're trying to get out of the chaff, out of the casing, whatever it is that you're trying to free. Once it's free, you quit threshing. And then you move on with your life. There's coming a time when God will plant again, where God will scoop up the grain. It might not be soon, God says, but it is coming. In Hebrews chapter 12, in Hebrews chapter 12,
the Hebrews writer anticipating many problems that were coming upon the body of Christ. They were coming upon the church, God's chosen people. In verse 3 he says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Bad things not only are happening to the church at present, they would be coming. In fact, the whole book of Revelation practically speaks to the troubles and the tribulation and the distress that was coming upon the body of Christ. And there was a need to be faithful regardless, to continue faithfully in your service to God, and there would be a reward. He says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now it takes a while to appreciate the punishment of your parents. It takes a long time to appreciate the scourging of the Lord. The opportunities to learn don't always come through flowers and pillows. Sometimes they come through hardships. And sometimes lessons, as we've talked about so many times, are learned the hard way. Sometimes because we won't learn them the easy way. Verse 7, he says, if you endure chastening, that is, if you go through it with the right mindset, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? One, <laughs> Jesus. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, that is, Jesus wasn't, didn't need to be chastened. Uh, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had hus uh, human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. We respect our parents. Because they were willing to chasten us, because they were willing to correct us, because they were willing to challenge us when we needed to be challenged. And we look back at those times, a lot of us anyway, and we appreciate what they were willing to do. And now I understand when my mom said, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it's going to hurt you, and I thought she'd gotten it backwards. She didn't. She didn't have it backwards. If my parents were willing to do that, and I now respect that they were willing to do that, and I see the benefit that I gained, or their attempt to gain that benefit in me, how much more so our Heavenly Father, who knows all things, who knows exactly what we need and exactly how to accomplish it, we're going to get there in just a moment. He says, verse 11, something that no one needs to be told. <clears throat> now... No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Whatever the chastening is, it doesn't have to be physically painful. It just has to be painful. It has to be problematic. It has to be a challenge to us. He says, nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. He says a number of things, but the most important and the one we oftentimes focus on is there in verse 11. No punishment is pleasant in the moment, but if received well with the appropriate attitude, it will bring on fruits that would not have otherwise been received. The question is, is there an obvious reason that I'm suffering? When people come to me, we've talked about this before a bit, when people come to me and they have been struggling with something, <coughs> struggling with their health or finding employment or whatever the case might be, and they are consistently struggling with it, constantly struggling with it, it keeps coming back, and it keeps coming back, I have them ask three questions. Am I saying your suffering is always your fault? No. That's not the case at all, necessarily. But the first question is, am I making bad decisions? No one likes being asked that. And yet, it's the most obvious question we should always ask. 
But Chris, everything happens for a reason. And I say, sure, but sometimes the reason is that you make bad decisions. People say, practically. No one actually says these things, but this is practically how we talk sometimes. Lord, keep me from suffering from my poor decisions. Prayers we make. We say, Lord, please turn these Cheetos into Sprite and carrots. Or the, uh, Cheetos and Sprite into carrots and water. Once they get into my stomach. Certainly don't do it before, or I wouldn't eat them in the first place. No. Lord, why did you give me cirrhosis of the liver? Not keeping in mind that they spent a lifetime of imbibing alcohol. People make bad choices, and we, as human beings, we make bad choices. And sometimes we suffer, and sometimes we struggle, and sometimes we're dealing with things simply because we haven't learned how to get over our problems. Get us out of the way and <coughs> deal with the things that really matter. And sometimes it's because we cover them up, and sometimes it's because we pretend they don't exist. Whatever the case might be, if I'm making bad decisions, I need to quit making those bad decisions or my life's not going to change. The second question I have people ask themselves is, is there something I could be learning from the situation that I might be missing? When I was young, and I learned my times tables, multiplication for those who don't know, my teacher, he would just say two numbers, and you were expected in the span of time to give the answer. He would click, and it would be eight and five. And he wouldn't even say and, eight, five, and he'd say 40. You guys aren't very good at this. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine, fine. But he would oftentimes, well, he would always repeat if you were wrong. So eight, eight, five, and you'd say 42 for whatever reason. He would say eight, five. And you had to guesstimate that you were wrong, but sometimes he would repeat it to see if you were sure of your answer. So he would say eight, five, you'd say 40, and then he'd say eight, five, and you'd have to decide whether you were right or wrong. How sure are you that eight times five is 40? Or eight times eight is 64? or any number of other categories of multiplication tables that you were responsible for? Is there something you could be learning from the situation that you may be missing? Because sometimes lessons come back to you because you didn't learn the lesson in the first place. And three, are you expressing patience and faith through these trials? Have you learned how to wait on the Lord? Because that might be the lesson that you need to learn. Perhaps it has nothing to do with the problem itself. Perhaps it's simply your dealing with the problem. Maybe it's a commitment to prayer. As Jesus talks about that woman who has an unrighteous judge who won't give her the lawsuit that she is that she should be getting. And she just keeps nagging him until he does. And he argues from that that if this woman to an unfaithful judge would be willing to do that, how much more so should we? And I think of the, the Gentile woman who comes to Jesus wanting her daughter to be healed. And he practically calls her a small dog. And it's to test whether she was willing to keep going. And she is. She is a mom. She's not letting this go. This is all the hope that she has in her daughter's life. Uh -oh. Are we expressing patience and faith through these trials? Are we waiting on the Lord? Are we learning how to do that? Because the chasing of the Lord can bring us advantages, can bring us growth, can help us be who we need to be. But they're not pleasant <clears> in the time. Neither is us making poor decisions, or us suffering because we make poor decisions, or because we're not learning from our mistakes. The second aspect here I want us to look at in Isaiah chapter 28, notice in verse 27. 27 to the rest of the chapter, it's a whole three verses, I know. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge. I don't know if you knew that or not. Nor is the cartwheel rolled over the cumin. He says, but the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. There is a prescribed way of releasing the grain from any particular grain, right? Releasing that, that nugget of what you're looking for from the chaff or whatever the outer casing is called. Plants are really good at protecting what's most important and it takes time and investment to get to it. My grandma always had a bowl of nuts. But she didn't have a bowl of nuts that you could just eat. You had to work for it. She had a little, a little nutcracker, and you had to 
crack the nut in such a way that it didn't just destroy the nut, which was the most frustrating thing ever. It was like she wanted to teach us something. She wanted to teach us patience, perhaps, or inadvertently she did so. She wanted to teach us how to use a nutcracker. I never did. I never figured it out. But there are four different ways that he's describing here of getting a grain out of whatever casing it's in. And depending on the grain, you have to use a different way. One way does not work for all of them. You don't roll every grain over with the cartwheel. Now, you might really feel like doing that some days. But some things you need to use a stick for, and some you need to use a rod for. Those are different, too. A stick gives more, and a rod does not give at all. And some things work really well, and other things don't work so well on everything. Notice verse 28, bread flour must be ground. Therefore, he does not thresh it forever. Break it with his cartwheel or crush it with his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. You see what he said there in verse 26? He said, for he instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him. The plowman is taught by God how to do things. Instructed on being patient and doing your job until it's done. And then being done with your job. In the other case, in verse 27 through 29, he says, this also comes from the Lord of hosts who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance, which implies God knows how to get the kernel of value out of anything. Now, do you suppose that God, through Isaiah, is talking to the Israelites about plants? Or is he talking about people? He's certainly talking about people. He's talking about the Israelites, because they feel like they've been plowed over and over and over again. That their lives have just been overturned repeatedly. Like they've been run over with a cart continually. And God won't let them go. But the truth is, the Lord knows what he's doing. So let's change the way we see trials. Four different ways to thrash for four different grains. And the whole purpose of plowing and threshing. First, the purpose of, or the outcome of plowing. It's for a fertile soil. If you turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. <laughs> First Peter chapter 5, notice in verse 5 he says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The word humble or humility, that's a four-letter word practically in this, in this culture. In the culture we live in, it, it's foul language to use the concept of humility. We must be arrogant and prideful in everything that we do according to the culture we live in. And yet what God is seeking is something more precious indeed. In verse 6 he says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Not immediately. Not on your time frame. But in due time, in due season, God stops plowing the field to plant it. And after it's done, the threshing is over, God picks up the grain. And he takes care of it. That precious grain that he's been seeking. Consider the three types of unproductive soil in the parable of the sower. The wayside, the rocky, and the weedy soils. The reason they don't produce is because they are not prepared. If only that wayside soil had used a plow from time to time to overturn the ground, they could have the word implanted. The rocky soil needed to pull up those stones, do the work to remove them in order that the seed would have depth of soil. And that weedy ground, obviously, needed to go out and pull some weeds. And that is our life, friends. Right? We need to be willing to do what is right and good for us and our future in the kingdom. Not necessarily what is easy or what is likable or what other people appreciate, but what is best for our soul, for our spirituality, what is best 
for our relationship with God, that we might preserve, as God tries to, that valuable grain. Luke chapter 12 and verse 7. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. It's not about the hairs on your head, though. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus would conclude that you could trade your soul for the whole world, and you would get a shoddy deal. It would be a terrible deal. All the wealth in the whole world, because what we fail to realize far too often is that you are a soul inside of a body, not a body with a soul. Even the language that we use, we talk about the soul that we have. We are the soul. That's our existence. And that's the only thing that's going to remain. Not this body. This body is a protective cover. This body is a husk. And sometimes the husk, in order to get it to produce that grain, it's got to be fresh. That doesn't sound very good, does it? And it's not very nice always. But God is willing to do what is best for us. And we need to be willing to endure because this very principle exists. And we understand it in the, the plant life, in the world of agriculture. Well, let's go to the world of agriculture. John 15 and verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit... He takes away. And you really wish that he'd stop there. But it's not a period. It's a semicolon. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You say, Lord, aren't you satisfied? And the Lord says, no, because I know you can do better. I know you can do more. I know you can be greater than you currently are. And so he gets those shears out. And he prunes. And the Lord knows what he's doing. The Lord knows how to accomplish what is best for us. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7, notice what he says there. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is our goal? Because if it's to get through life easily, that's not a difficult thing to do. Then we should just give up on the Lord right now. But if our goal is to make it to heaven, for that day to come when we will be ushered into the kingdom, ushered into God's presence, and our goal is to remain with him forevermore in heaven, We've got to do the preparation now. We've got to become the people that God is calling us to be. We've got to question ourselves and our actions and our decisions. We've got to see if what we're doing is truly the will of God or is our own doing. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, he says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season... I love all these references. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And so easy to do. It's so easy to give up. But what the lessons there from Isaiah 28, both of the, the passages that we talked about, they ended with God knows what he's doing. Who do you think taught the plowman that he shouldn't plow forever? Who do you think taught the people who thresh when to stop and to collect the grain? It was the Lord, because the Lord knows how to bring the best out of us. Not always the most pleasant life, not always the most prosperous life, but the best possible spiritual life is available to us in his son and there are two lessons tonight i want you to take away from this sometimes to get people out of their shell you have to run them over with a cart not literally hopefully but perhaps beat them with a rod no the lesson i get in part from this is that one size doesn't fit all the way we approach evangelism and the way we approach individuals in the congregation can't be the same every time. Simply because nobody's the same. <laughs> People aren't the same. And so the way, the strategies that we use to reach the lost, it can't be the same every time because that's not going to work. We can't get so focused or thinking that there's some miracle answer out there. Because I will tell you the church has been searching for it forever. And the answer is always the same. The best way to reach the lost is to get to know the people, is to spread the seed as far and wide as you can, to help people pull up stones, to help people pull weeds. Sometimes 
It's a plow in the hand that overturns the soil and gets people ready. <coughs> Is it your responsibility to get their hearts ready? No, but you can help them. You can help them drive that plow. You can help them pull those stones. You can help them pull those weeds. And sometimes it's exactly what the body of Christ needs. But there's not one way to do it. There's not one answer to all of our problems. That's what we really like. The second lesson that I take from this is that the Lord knows what is best, and the Lord will do it. The Lord will accomplish it regardless. You can know what is best for you. You can know because the Lord has revealed it in His Word. He has given us all things pertaining to life and Godliness. He has provided for us how to be saved and how to accomplish His will, receive His promises, and get to that point in our life where regardless of what happens, we can leave our trust and our patience and our hope in His hands. Our very soul in His possession. And from then, regardless of what happens, we don't need to worry. Worry about the tribulation, the trials, the persecution, and the problems, because we are then the Lord's, and nothing else matters. If you need to become the Lord's today, remember that the chastening of the Lord, just because you're chastened doesn't mean that you're on the wrong track. In fact, he ignores illegitimate children. That's the lesson from Hebrews chapter 12. Illegitimate children, people who refuse to be his, don't get chastened anymore. Because they won't respond to it anyway. We need to be individuals who will come to him. Who will change. Who will repent of our sins when we make <clears throat> mistakes and when we <throat> problems creep up. And we'll come to him with our prayers and with our hearts and with our love. And we'll help one another do what is best. Not only for the kingdom of heaven, but each and every soul that is present in our life. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation tonight, if you need to make your life right with God, tonight is the night to do it. Now is always the time. And if you need to come back to the Lord or you need help staying with the Lord, whatever you need, I pray that you would come and ask together we stand.